Actually, you could try it yourself. It's almost impossible to say the word sustainable happiness without smiling. (laughs) So I'm going to start with something a little bit um, interactive. I'm going to ask you to turn to somebody at your table, and if there's just three of you, you can do it as a trio if you like, but you still have to do it in the time that two would do it. You've got two minutes. You've got one minute to tell your favorite act of transportation story. One of your happiest moments where you've been involved in active transportation. And I'm giving you another job, and I'm going to keep talking because I know you're processing. Oh, what what story am I going to tell? Uh, What I want you to notice when you're telling that story is what happens to you and what happens to your partner as you tell the story because you're going to be actively listening to your partner's story, noticing what happens to you physically and emotionally. It's going to get noisy in here. So what you're going to do is keep an eye out for me. I'll be waving one hand when one minute's up. That means you you should be changing and the other person should be talking. If you see both hands waving, that means that the time is up. Can you actually see her? No. Do we need something else then to to signal? Will you hear me? Yeah. Click a glass. Okay. All right. So find a partner, your favorite, one of your happiest active transportation stories. Go. That was a good question. Can you actually see her? Because I can't see them. Yeah. It's dark as it's pitch dark. It's always a trade-off between seeing the screen and seeing the person, but this is a bit excessive. Yeah, okay. And I think it's also... We didn't say that it would be a glass for, for one point. Uh, are you ready now? For one, they should be changing. One. You should be changing. The other person should be talking now. Okay, can you do some more clinking for me? Okay, could you wrap up your stories, please? I know those are really quick ones. Wrap up your stories, please. We need, no, we need more clinking. Could you wrap up your stories, please? Thanks. First of all, I want to point out that in order for you to tell your story, I know it's hard to disengage once you start telling that story, you just want to finish. What I want to point out is I didn't have to define happiness for you. Uh, And what you probably would find if we were in a smaller group and I start to take um, information from people, what I find in workshops, what people say that they notice is obviously more smiling starts to happen. People tend to feel that energy goes up in the room. Um, there's more eye contact, uh, there can be a sense of well-being, uh, there could be um, a little more hand gestures, I was noticing that, I've actually even seen people jumping up and down in their seats because they get very excited, but it, in fact, you might even have given yourself a little bit of a boost to your immune system even with those positive emotions. And there's often uh, an instant rapport. Even if you didn't know the person, you can easily begin to exchange a story about happiness. It doesn't even have to be about active transportation. I just picked that for today. Now, I know it's the end of the day, and we've all been surveyed. We might have a bit of a weariness of being surveyed, but I do, I'm going to do a hands-up one with you. How many of you are already thinking about happiness being applied to your work? Hands up. So we've got a pretty good base of people to work with in terms of thinking already about happiness. I'm going to try and get everybody to be convinced by the end of this presentation to not only think about happiness, but to think about sustainable happiness. 
And I'd like to invite you to imagine that we can actually plan communities that foster happiness and well-being. And one of the things that needs to change in order for that to happen is this, uh, that we recognize that this is what we've been doing, right? I'm going to go through some of the next slides fairly quickly because given the, some of the speakers we've had today, uh, you're actually, I think, fairly aware of some of these statistics, particularly around children. I've been gathering information for more than 12 years, looking at the health impacts in terms of air quality. Um, we've also heard about traffic fatalities. It's the, it continues to be over these 12 years the, the leading cause of injury death for children over the age of one year and preventable. But we also have to look at other things, loss of opportunity for independent mobility, for just getting around on their own. We're looking at studies, too, where children who are living in high-traffic areas, they don't go as far, their range of play, the kinds of play that they're engaged in has, is being limited. And yet we're also seeing health research that's um, linking transport and planning to cancer prevention strategies. We're looking at work, you know, 12 years ago when I first started going to transportation conferences talking about children, I was the only academic in Canada. In fact, I was introduced at one conference, and it wasn't such a wonderful one as the one you just gave me. He actually said, at first I wondered what this paper was doing at this conference. <laughs> and he paused long enough for me to go, this is my first, this is my worst nightmare. And then he carried it on, and he said, and then I read it, and I really want you to give it your utmost attention and what I realized is he needed to soften them up for me because people were not thinking about children at all in terms of transportation and urban planning. And Paul mentioned the uh, Child and Youth-Friendly Land Use and Transport Planning Guidelines that I worked on with Richard Gilbert. They've been developed for every province. This is kind of the strategy around them. There are 19 guidelines, but the entire document gives the rationale behind it. It gives specific examples from your province. Uh, and it's organized in this way, thinking about children as pedestrians, cyclists, transit users, and so on. There is a version for rural areas. We didn't create one uh, for remote areas, but I was just in Nunavut two weeks ago, and I believe someone there is going to take that on in terms of actually Nunavutizing it, looking at what, you know what, these six guidelines don't apply to us, but maybe we need six more, six different ones. So if you get in touch with me, if you're interested in more remote areas, we might have something in the coming year. I'm just going to give you a flavor of what the guidelines are. In the, and you can read them. I won't read them off to you um, throughout. I'm sure you're capable of seeing that it's, it's really not rocket science. It's really very basic kinds of thinking. But when we first started to do this, and I was meeting with municipal uh, staff across the country, I mean, I had one in a major city say, you know what, I don't think children are even uh, mentioned in our official plan. We're also encouraging children and youth to be involved in the kind of planning that we're doing. I was involved in the active transportation plan in Sydney for the Cape Breton Regional Municipality, and we actually walked around with youth. They showed us the areas uh, that give them a sense of uh, sort of fostering or fracturing their, their experience in the area, showing us the school where they're not allowed to bring their bicycles, and that was changed actually after that walk. But we look at them as pedestrians, and so, again, these are just really very basic questions, but, it, but it's just being brought together so that um, the profile is raised as we think about children and in in youth in our communities. And then we look at them as cyclists, and again, Paul showed you that kind of diameter. You can increase the distance that, that children and youth can travel if we can make those areas more cyclable. I'm particularly concerned around schools because... My experience in meeting with stakeholders right across the country is that very often the education sector was absent from these discussions, seemed to see themselves as involved in school busing and not having uh, a, seeing themselves as stakeholders in other kinds of transportation. And so one of the things we're encouraging is for people to begin to look at, do they have an AT policy? Or are they involved in helping to supervise walking school buses? Are you familiar with walking school buses? It's kind of like carpooling where... Um, if I don't have time to walk my children every day, but maybe I'll do it one day, my neighbor does it the next, the next neighbor does it the next. And so groups of children have that opportunity to walk to school with supervision. They get the physical activity, get to know their neighborhood, and so on. And this was an activity that was at, uh, organized here last year. And I'll just guideline 18, and we also heard uh, from others today, I think it was Paul, around reducing speed, and you can just get a sense from that 
icon how we can reduce the risk of injury as we reduce those speeds. And for those of you who are familiar with these kind of turns, so child and new friendly planning fits into any of these areas. We heard about age-friendly communities today. Uh, where this is going at this point is there are a number of municipalities that have actually taken on the idea of having a child and youth friendly community. In Sydney, it's been written into our active transportation plan. The Ontario Professional Planning Institute has actually officially uh, um, endorsed the guidelines. But what does this have to do with happiness? You might be kind of wondering about that. It was actually children uh, who got me looking at the happiness research. I was hearing about them on their school trip saying, you know, I walk to school and I get to see a kitty or a pup and I sing along with the birds. Or I walked with my dad. I wish he could walk with me every day. And quite frankly, I was thinking, you know, these positive emotions must be really important. They must be really good for us. But I'm a little bit scared to go to a transportation conference and just say that. So I think I need to do a little investigation into this. And so I'll tell you in a few moments where that led me. Just want to mention school travel planning because I think this is a project that we're working on uh, right across the country, integrating school travel planning. And so school travel planning are coming together with the guidelines. So we, now we have municipalities, school boards, and other stakeholders seeing how do we make this situation better for children. And we're including sustainable happiness in that. So we began last year, uh, or sorry, in 2010, to work with the city of St. John's. You can see who the stakeholders are there. And the, the lead person on that here, the lead contact would be Karen Sheriffs and Peter Hines. Peter Hines will be here tomorrow if you wanted to talk to him. The project started here, but you might be thinking uh, in the community you're in that this is something that you'd be interested in as well. These are the schools that are involved here. So we're seeing um, that experience of those positive experience that kids have on their trip to school is an example of sustainable happiness. And I'll give you the definition in a moment. And this is from the survey that was done there where parents were giving what are their concerns. You can see the top ones are traffic issues, and you can see on down the line. Main reasons parents say that they drive their kids to school, you can see those there. It's important to look at the one around distance because at least half the parents are living within 1.5 kilometers. The families are living within 1.5 kilometers. This is data now from right across Canada. This is giving you an idea of the travel mode. And the thing to look at, and you might be want to think about in your communities, is that the, in the AM is the light blue and the dark blue is the PM, that there's a difference in terms of the walking and, and the um, car use. So we were finding that parents may be dropping their kids off, but then they're letting them walk home. So if we can look at those kinds of environments, we might be able to increase the opportunities for children to be walking safely. Oh, now we're getting a little more into the happiness. We were asking um, parents and children what their experience is on the walk to school, and this has never been done before to my knowledge. So this is data from right across the country. You can see what parents are the light blue are drivers, walkers are the dark blue. So parents who are walking with their children uh, feel a little less relaxed, or, and, but less rushed and happier. And on the right, what children are telling us is that they're less tired, they're more relaxed, and they're happier. So I was glad to see that. Um, and this is Newfoundland specifically. And we have about 1,000 surveys from, from this area, from the School Travel Planning Project. Uh, the bright green is the walking. So this is what parents are saying. They're, they're more relaxed, they're happier, and quite a bit happier. Uh, I'm not sure why they're a little less content. They're more calm more energized and less rushed, less frustrated, slightly more anxious, and the others are, are almost the same. If we look at what kids were saying, and they're the bright green again, that they're happier, they're more excited, they're a little less relaxed, they're way more curious, less tired, less bored, and less worried. Enrique Peñalosa really uh, said this. Uh, he was probably ahead of his time when he said, talked about this, that if we can make a, success, a city successful for children, we're likely to make it successful for everyone. Well, his brother, uh, Gil Peñalosa, lives in Canada and has developed an organization called 880 Cities, thinking about cities for all ages. And I uh, was working with Gil last week in Guadalajara, or two weeks ago in Guadalajara, and I'm not putting this picture up to drive you crazy. <laughs> it's actually quite, it was quite beautiful and sunny and warm and so on. 
But I want to tell you about an example of sustainable happiness. I was able to participate in their Via Recreativa, where the streets are closed to traffic and open to the public every single Sunday from 8 a.m. till 2 p.m. More than a million people come out. And I honestly felt tears of joy as I was there because it was the most poignant example of sustainable happiness I've ever experienced. People of all ages were there, all ages. There were people walking, cycling. There were people with strollers, rollerblades, skateboards. These youth we interviewed, we said, what would you be doing if you weren't here today on Sunday? And they said, well, probably nothing. And what is it like normally for you when you're around when you skateboard? And they said, well, people kind of look at us like criminals. And in fact, in Canada, we haven't quite figured out how to deal with skateboards. And this is the active transportation form that many youth are, are most interested in taking. I just want to give you a sense that if we had music here, if we could have a nice Latin beat, that this would get, this would set the stage, the sense of festivity. There were stations all along. The, it was 65 kilometers and, and fairly flat. But stations all along the way, music constantly. This was a place you could come to get your hair cut for free. And when I went to the aerobic station where we were being led, just like we were with the, with the break a few minutes ago, these ladies had joined that, and they were, doing the, they were doing the aerobics. You could carry on further, and these kids were doing hula hoop dancing. We went to, um, went to a park where they said, you know, this park was a place that nobody used to go to. It was a place being used by drug, drug users. But now this Via Recreativa has really changed that. Now, Guadalajara has a whole host of problems, but they have now become the place in the world where other cities are coming to try to understand what, how did they make this work. And so they've got Toronto, L.A., Boston, uh, cities from all over North America are coming now to Guadalajara because this is really giving people a sense of what does it feel like. It feels wonderful when you have this opportunity to move around safely in your city. Just last July, the UN uh, passed this resolution suggesting that member states should be giving greater attention to happiness and well-being in our development policies. Well, I think about happiness pretty much every day. And as an educator, one of the things I think about when I see these kind of policies is who or what is teaching us about happiness and what are they teaching? Because it hasn't typically been part of our education process. So if we're thinking about integrating happiness and well-being into our planning, into our policies, where is that idea going to come from? And what, are the, what is the general public's view about happiness? Well, I've been taking a look at that, and I, I find that this is kind of the socialization that we're having pretty much, right? Shop till you drop, designer fashions for your kids, this is one way that uh, we can look at it. And I thought of the lawns just today when I, when, I, um, when I looked at this because I don't know this dog, actually. I just got this picture off the Internet, but I'm going to call her Fifi. And now if you look at Fifi, she's got quite a nice little home. Looks like somebody cares for her very much. They, somebody's painted the little house. She's got a nice little comfortable place to sit, hasn't she? But if Fido moves next door... She might suddenly feel she doesn't quite have the best place, you know. And he, he's got his name. He's got flowers. He even actually looks happier. And don't you think? And he's got lawn. And when you think about that, when you think about trying to change behavior, we're, all, we're so locked in that. And I think that's something that's really important to, t to pay attention to. Uh, this person might feel quite excited and wonderful about their, their Hummer until this person comes next to them. I'm starting to see ads actually putting a price tag on happiness. And I always add guaranteed for day of purchase only because we know that with really authentic happiness, it's not the buzz from shopping. And there's no doubt that people experience that. But that enduring sense of contentment and life satisfaction isn't going to co be coming from those kinds of things. But the advertisers have really picked up on the happiness research that's been coming out of positive psychology for the last 10 years. Coca-Cola's got its happiness truck that pulls up in the Philippines, and you push the button and all kinds of things come out, and people look so happy they're lined up to get their plastic flowers or their, <laughs> or their Coca-Cola bottles or whatever comes out. But these are the kinds of things that we know from the happiness research are really very, very important. And it has very little to do, as you can see, with materialism. 
There's also research looking at can money buy happiness. And again, once people have met their basic needs and a little bit more for some financial security, they are not significantly happier. I'll just uh, want to introduce you to this. This is something that my students taught me about as a great example of sustainable happiness. They called it natural highs. And you can see from the list, I've been collecting these over the years. Uh, one of the ones that uh, I recall, too, is you know, making eye contact with my son. It doesn't happen very often because he's autistic. Another, you can see some of the other ones there that I've been picking up. And some of the others are um, having a forest bath. And that actually, I thought it meant going into the forest and having a bath, but the fellow explained, no, it's actually when you go into the forest and you really just drink in all the sensations of being there. The most unusual was from a lawyer who said, cross-examining a witness who's lying. (laughs) (laughs) I've heard bagpipes starting, and I've also heard bagpipes stopping. (laughs) But here's what we, what we are getting from some of the happiness and health research. There was a study down a, out in Nova Scotia over 10 years tracking people, showing that with more positive emotions, there was reduced risk of cardiovascular de- disease. Some studies showing that people, happier people live longer, are more inclined to seek out and act on health information, hugely significant if we're thinking of health promotion. And, of course, the positive emotions uh, associated with physical activity What I was finding, though, as I was looking at this happiness research, I fell in love with it. And, of course, my background has been in sustainability for 20 years, and it felt like neither of these two areas were talking to each other. And so it struck me that it might be useful to come up with a new concept called sustainable happiness. And I created a definition over the years that it's happiness that contributes to individual, community, and or global well-being without exploiting other people, the environment, or future generations. So you can get an idea that there are just, the limits are only your imagination, how this might be applied. Whether it's in your work environment, whether it's in your personal life or your professional life, or how we plan our communities. Um, You can think about how we transport ourselves. Where did our clothes come from? If might love my, my jacket, but if it was made in a sweatshop, then my happiness has been on the back of somebody else. We can look at where our food comes from, how we relate to one another. I teach a course in sustainable happiness at Cape Breton University. It's my favorite course to teach. And I actually don't have to talk about health too much with my students, and they shift. They shift towards more healthful and sustainable behaviors throughout the course. I already mentioned that walking and cycling and commuting we see as an example of sustainable happiness. This is a drawing that was done by a grade four student. She had never heard of sustainable happiness, but she really inherently gets that. I don't know if you can read it in the back, so I'll read it out. Walking to school makes a happy earth, which makes happy faces. And if you look through at the top, you can see there's happy pants walking through. She's got hearts. She's got trees. She's actually, I think, really captured it quite beautifully. Now, I have to ask, is there somebody here who knows, is there a happy road in paradise? Isn't that a great question? I came across that on the Internet. Can anybody tell me if there's a happy road in paradise? What's that? All right. (laughs) So I'm just going to leave you with a few questions. If you think about sustainable happiness, if you think about fostering happiness and well-being, What kind of planning is going to contribute to well-being? I think we heard multiple examples today. We saw toolkits, resources. We actually know how to do this. And I think it's a matter of doing many of the things that people recommended in terms of gathering political will and collaborating. We can also ask ourselves about intelligent mobility. You know, if we're not meeting those mobility needs of everyone, then we we really aren't uh, developing efficient systems. And finally, I'd say... How can we plan our communities to foster sustainable happiness? And I think there's probably things that you're already doing in your community. You, if you thought about it, there's probably already examples that you are, are doing. But wouldn't it be amazing if Newfoundland and Labrador became the province that really grasped uh, to call on sustainable happiness and became the place that everybody came to to try understand how did they do that? How did they make those shifts where those communities are actually fostering happiness and well-being? I think you've already got an edge on, on the rest of, rest of the world in terms of happiness. And there's just so many other areas where we can just bring it all together, I think. I think that's the last one. And I think 
my, my, I know I'm biased, but I do think that with sustainable happiness, we take happiness and well-being to a new level. Thank you.